chapter 1. In between Ezra and Esther, you're having a hard time finding that. If you'll find Psalms, go back a book, you'll find Job, and then you go back Esther, and then you'll find Nehemiah, chapter 1. And we're going to pick up on uh, verse 1 and read 11 verses here in just a moment. And I'm going to have to talk, maybe just a little bit faster, Francis, today. Okay, Francis got me talking so slow over here, Steve, you know, because my good buddy Brian Edenfield from Georgia, who I encouraged uh, this morning, he still keeps reminding me to tell you that he taught me how to talk so slow. <laughs> he says, I'll tell you when he used to talk fast, so slow word, we'll put it that way. Hey, welcome to our online crowd. We love you. We appreciate you tuning in from wherever you are around the world. Just uh, tell us hello. Tell us where you're watching from. We're going to be in Nehemiah there in the Old Testament. Nehemiah, get your Bibles open up even at home because God has a word in season just for you. So he really wants us to really dial in and focus and pay attention when the word of God is being proclaimed because it really is powerful. And even in somebody's house, even if you're in another country across the pond, uh, you really can make a difference and you really can experience a fresh encounter with the living God. So here we are on our second Sunday of the new year. We really want to ask ourselves a question. Where are we going in 2024? And what are we doing? So I was just laying on my bed last night and just casting vision in my mind and talking to the Lord about it and just really finding out where are we going, uh, not only for ourselves individually, but as a family, as a church, uh, if you're in a job, like I have a business, in the business, where does God want to take it? So a lot of things going on. And so we hope that God will speak to us throughout this series in Nehemiah. And so on November 21st, 1989, the Berlin Wall began to fall. And I'm sure that your father is probably glad to hear about that, John. But after years of oppression and division, finally there came unity in Germany when West and East came together. And the tearing down of the Berlin Wall was a sign of victory, unity, and freedom. The world watched as the people uh, rejoiced with the people there of Germany as the wall began, began to fall down. Now, there are times when walls need to come down. Walls of hatred and walls of division must be broken down. With that in mind, we must discern between barriers of hindrance and walls of protection. There are some walls in the Christian faith that should never, ever be broken down or weakened in any kind of way. Now, after a couple of decades of ministering in churches, uh, and after much prayer and observation, I believe that there are several walls that need to be rebuilt in the Christian's life. Uh, broken down walls leave the people vulnerable to attacks of the enemy. And the enemy is certainly trying to attack each and every one of us. Now the walls that the church builds are not physical. We're going to look at how Nehemiah built a physical wall around Jerusalem. But we're going to look at some spiritual implications of this wall because God has not told us to build a wall around our city. And so we're going to be looking at spiritual walls, walls of prayer, walls of worship, accountability, faith, unity, repentance, church membership. All of these are just some of the walls that we're going to be looking at over the next few months as we examine this wonderful letter in Nehemiah. Now the first wall is found in Nehemiah chapter 1, which we'll look at today, and it's the wall of prayer. Listen to what E. Stanley Jones said about prayer. He said, prayer is surrender. Surrender to the will of God in cooperation with that will. If I throw out a boat hook from a boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull the sh myself to the shore? Prayer is not the pulling of God to my will, but the aligning of my will to the will of God. So oftentimes we're frustrated in our prayer life because we're, we're praying for something. We expect God to move in a certain kind of way. And then when God says, I never promised that. And I'm working in a different way. Then what happens is we get discouraged and frustrated with God and say, you didn't answer the prayer the way I thought you were going to answer it. Or we buy into these TV preachers who say, you can just name it and claim it. And we think that we can just say whatever we want and God's some divine butler up in the sky at our beck and call to come running whenever we want him to. And so we need to be careful of that. Now, prayer is a vital block in the overall wall of the church. Prayer is foundational. Jesus put it this way, that prayer, my house should be called a house of prayer. And so prayer is very important. And we ought to be praying, as John challenged us to do a little while ago, that we ought to improve our prayer life throughout 2024. The sweet hour of prayer where we need to come and talk to our Heavenly Father and see what He has for us to do. Now, Nehemiah received a report about the deplorable conditions there in Jerusalem. And prayer is a central theme all throughout this book. The very first thing that Nehemiah did, which we'll read here in a minute, is he began to pray. He fasted 
and he prayed and he wept and he mourned, he confessed sin, and he begged the Lord to minister in that situation. Now, Nehemiah understood the importance of prayer. The question is, do we? And we're going to find out as we examine this subject, rebuilding the wall of prayer. Rebuilding the wall of prayer. Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's stand together all over the building. As we honor and reverence the reading of God's Word, Nehemiah chapter 1, reading from verse 1 down to the end of the chapter, you follow along as I read, because these now are the words of our living God. The word of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said... I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there. And I will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeem by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. Let's pray together. Our great and our awesome God, we thank you so much for those sweet hour prayers that come to our lives so often. We thank you that Jesus made a way for us to come into your presence and talk to you and lay down any burdens that may be on our heart. And just as Nehemiah was a man of prayer, we pray that you'd help us to be men of prayer as well and women of prayer, that all of us would pray from the youngest to the oldest. Lord, I pray for those who have yet to repent of their sins and surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and have no access to your throne. Lord, I pray you save them this hour. Father, would you speak to us here on campus and to those watching from around the world? Would you minister not only here at Real Impact Church, but in every church that meets today? May the Spirit of God have liberty to do as He desires, to change lives as He desires. Father, we love you. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do here today. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Well, the first thing that we notice in rebuilding the wall of prayer, that there was a report of the problem. The report of the problem. So Nehemiah asked these friends of his who came to visit from Jerusalem what was going on, and they came and they brought a report. Now, verse 1 says the words of Nehemiah. We'll read about another Nehemiah in chapter 3, verse 16, but this one here, he is the cupbearer to the king of Persia as we read at the close of verse, uh, and, 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 uh, verse 11 there. Now, this was a very important position. We think about a cupbearer, we think about maybe a, a modern-day butler, but this is far more important than our modern-day butler. He had to taste the king's wine to make sure that it wasn't poison. So he had to be a man trustworthy because the king was putting his life in this man's hand. And he wanted to know if this wine is poison, if this food is poison, he wanted to know about it. And so he had to be somebody who the king could trust with his very life. But he also needed to be a man of wisdom and culture to be so close to the king. The king did not want to hang around people who did not have any culture and any wisdom and any etiquette. So this had to be a very, very specific kind of person. 
This reminds me that the cupbearer was a man of great influence, which is vitally important. Now, this simple bit of information that seems like an afterthought at the end of the chapter, when Nehemiah states that he was the cupbearer to the king, we may gloss over it very quickly and not think much about it. But it's a very, very important truth that we hear today. This reminds me of two very key important truths. Number one, it reminds me of God's providence. Nehemiah could not have helped the Jews, as we will see all throughout this letter, had he not been in this position to go to the king. We'll see next week when he made the statement there, how he said, give me uh, grace and mercy and help as I go in and talk to this man. The man he's talking about is the king of Persia. And he's saying, I'm fixing to go in and ask him, can you possibly allow any kind of help to come? And next week we're going to rebuild the wall of faith in chapter 2, and we'll see how this is vitally important. So he had to be in this position with a good relationship and standing with the king to be able to go in and make the kind of request he's going to make next week. And we're going to see how he made some very big, bold requests from the king next week. But it also reminds me of Nehemiah's compassion. Nehemiah is over there in Susa, and they are over there in Jerusalem. They're a long ways away. He is living a good life there in the king's palace. Because of his position, he's doing very well for himself. And he could have just said, that's their problem. Sorry to hear about it. I pray for y'all. Good luck to you. But he saw the nation's problem as his own problem. And we need to be like that as well. We need to say the nation's in a mess because the church is in a mess. And we need to get our act together in order to get this nation turned around. And the hope for this nation is not going to come in November at the next election. It's going to come if the Lord Jesus Christ begins to change lives here in America. And it starts with us. And we're just saying about how he is still working here. And so God's always working. He never stops working. And we're just saying that a moment ago. And so Jesus said that he was looking for where God was at work and joined him in the great work he was already doing. He said, my father's still working. When they asked, why are you working on the Sabbath? Because my father's working. And there's no days off in ministry. So we serve the Lord all the time and diligently. And so he says there in verse 1, he said, Now it happened in the month Chislev in the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanane, one of the, my brothers and some men from Judah, came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity about Jerusalem. So the events in this book begin in the winter of 445 B.C., so December. Jerusalem had been destroyed in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians. Persia conquered Babylon, and some 50,000 Jews were allowed to return in 536 B.C. to rebuild the temple. Uh, you read about that in the book of Haggai, how they were dragging their feet, and God got mad, told them to consider their ways, and then he said, look at your house. It looks beautiful. My house is a mess. And so they finally got it straightened out and built the temple. Uh, after many delays, they finally finished that temple, but some 70 years have passed, and the wall around the city is still broken down. So they got the temple built up. They can offer the sacrifices, but there's no wall. Right. You've got to have a wall around the city for protection so enemies don't come in and attack. So in verses 2 and 3, Nehemiah asked them for a report. And what he got was a very bleak one. Now these guys didn't try to beat around the bush. So they said there in verse 3, they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. What are they saying? They're saying the place is in a mess and the people are in a mess. They're saying the wall is torn down. The people are vulnerable to the enemy's attack. And it's a reminder of what happened when Babylon came in and destroyed them. Why did it happen? Because God allowed it to happen as punishment because they had rebelled against God. So it's a daily reminder how terrible the place looked. We're going to see next week in chapter 2 how Nehemiah went to town and he spent three days just walking around the wall. And they had been stumbling over the rubble for so long they didn't even notice it. And when I came here uh, a little bit over seven years ago, the very first thing I noticed was how terrible the place looked. Dead bushes out front, carpet that was stained, hanging down chandeliers. I mean, it looked so old and outdated. But the problem was everybody kept walking past it week in and week out that nobody even noticed it. It takes an outsider to see some of these things. So when I went back to 
uh, uh, my old church there in Tallahassee, Enon, uh, last year, the free homecoming, me and Lewis spent several hours with the pastor there and the deacons, casting vision and looking at it. And Lewis should be glad to know that they finally started implementing some of the stuff we talked about. And I told him, I said, send me some pictures today. I want to see what it looks like. And encourage your people and really build them up for their vision, they're buying into it and getting it done. And so we cast vision with them while we're up there. I said, bring in somebody into your nursery. And I told the pastor, you got a little baby in the nursery and in, in, in daycare right now? Pay the lady there, one's that place, a hundred bucks. And say, come here and speak to my people and tell them what is wrong with this nursery. Uh, we're going to do some training for our ushers and our greeters here in a couple weeks. And we want to raise the bar in 2024 and do things with greater excellence and not just say, well, we're small, it's not a big deal. Uh, we give God our very, very best. So when I came here, I told them, down there at Disney World, you can say a lot of things about Disney, what you think about it, what you don't think about it. One thing you won't say about Disney is that they're not very professional because they are. You won't say the place is a pigsty because it's very clean. You won't say you can't find anybody here who smiles because they're all smiling. And they're doing it for a mouse. Listen now, we're doing it for the Lord. And God demands and deserves our best. So if they can do it for a mouse, God help me that I would give my best to my master. So Nehemiah wanted a report and he got one. And it was an honest report. They weren't beating around the bush. They weren't trying to be negative. They weren't a bunch of naysayers and critics and complainers. Uh, they gave him a very honest report and the report was honestly given, it's a mess. And the people over there are stressed out because the place looks terrible and they're stressed out. Now, pretending that a problem doesn't exist won't make it go away. We need people going to be honest with us. I want people to speak into my life that are going to speak honestly and truthful to me. I don't want a bunch of yes men around me. I want people going to help me to grow as an individual. That's why I've told you for years now you need to have a same-sex accountability partner who's going to speak truth into your life. And when you're not doing right, they need to say, hey, no excuses, get it going. Well, I didn't read my Bible today because I was tired. No excuses. Get up and read your Bible. And so we need people who are going to be honest with us. Not a bunch of complainers and negative people who just want to beat us up all the time. Uh, I don't want to hang around with complainers. I got no time for whiners. I, I had a pastor tell me one time, I got plenty of time for winners, no time for whiners. He says, thank you, neither do I. But O.S. Hawkins put it this way, many of us never rebuild because we don't make an honest evaluation of our own circumstances and situations. We never admit our need. Wow. So I put a post out there talking about the dog business. I said, the dog of your dreams begins with a simple phone call from you. I cannot help you if you don't call me. If you call me, I will straighten that dog out and I'll straighten you out. It'll be a lot more work to straighten them out than the dog because the dog will figure it out real fast. I told all my pastor buddies, you wish that everybody in your church would behave as well as these dogs do. Every teacher in town wishes that their kids would behave as well as these dogs do. You can be certain of that. So we've got to ask ourselves a question. What changes do we need to make in 2024? How are we going to raise the bar and, and really expect God to move in a fresh new way? Remember what we saw last week when the people there in Jesus' own hometown, he couldn't do any works? The Bible didn't say that he didn't feel like doing any good works. said he couldn't do any good works because he works in the context of our faith. And the people there did not trust in Jesus to do anything worthwhile there in the town. So it said his hands were tied. And then we asked the question, could God possibly do something here in this church that he's never done before? Could he possibly use one of us in a way like he's never used us before? Or do we say, well, no, that's for first Umatilla. Yeah, maybe first Orlando might grow. Maybe Johnny Hunt might be used by God. Maybe Adrian Rogers. But certainly God can't do nothing in my life because your faith is too small and your vision is too small. And we need Nehemiah to help us to have a strong vision. So do we need to re rebuild the wall of prayer? How's your prayer life? Are you spending ample time hanging out with the Father? Seeking His face every day? Praying? We just say, well, I hope folks get saved. Well, how much time have you labored in prayer about these matters? Didn't Jesus just teach us a few weeks ago as we went through the Sermon on the Mount to keep on seeking, keep on asking, keep on knocking? You can't get it done praying two or three minutes a day. So we need to labor and prayer. We'll take a look at how long Nehemiah prayed. I can tell you right now, he prayed a long time. So we move from the report of the problem. What about the response with prayer? Thank God for the response with prayer. 
So Nehemiah didn't just say, wow, I'm so sorry to hear that kind of statement. That really breaks my heart. What are we going to do? Uh, he went to the only source where he could find any hope, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ and Almighty God. So look what it said in verse 4. When I heard these words, what did he do? Did he wring his hands? Did he get nervous? Did he say, well, we're just defeated? And did he say, well, do something about it yourself? No, he said, I sat down and he wept and he mourned for days because he was broken. Because he saw the nation's problem as his own problem. So he say, well, the world is lost and on the way to hell. But what are you doing about it? So Lewis taught the youth today that when a blind guy in John chapter 9 got saved and God moved in his life, he went and talked to the religious leaders. They started asking a lot of spiritual questions that he couldn't answer. And he says, I don't know any about that stuff, but I do know I was blind and now I see. And the reason why I can see now is because Jesus Christ changed my life. So somebody says, what about you? Jesus Christ changed my life. Wait a minute now. Have you ever come out of that grave? Because we're born dead not trespasses. Why do you think he said that, coming out of the grave? What grave? What are you talking about? We're born dead not trespasses. So we're dead. And what has to happen when you're dead? You have to have new life. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. Stop worrying about how you were born and be worried about being born again. And I came out of that grave July 27, 1997. And I feel like running out of the grave. I got Steve here. Maybe if he gets excited enough, he'll run for me because he's in better shape than I am. So prayer, he said, I fasted and I prayed. Uh, remember, I asked a question when we preached on the subject of fasting. How many people have ever heard the subject on fasting? Only about two hands went up that they even heard a sermon on fasting. And then very few raised their hand and said, I've ever fasted in my life. Well, Jesus said, when you fast, he expects us to fast. Here Nehemiah says, I knew that already before Jesus spoke those words because I said I was fasting and praying. Wow. You know what fasting speaks about? It means I'm, I'm really broken. And I'm urgent to have an answer from God. And I want to really get serious. I don't want to just pray a little two-minute prayer and get on about my day. I want to really labor in prayer and really fast and weep. There was at least one good preacher that came out of Boston not me, it was Jonathan Edwards, another John. Jonathan Edwards, he preached that sermon, Sin is in the Hands of an Angry God. He was so overwhelmed and broken, he drew a circle and said, God, I will not leave this circle until you bring me revival. He was there for three days. Then he got up, got out of that circle, and preached that wonderful sermon, Sin is in the Hands of an Angry God. Wow. Revival broke out. The people were crying out to him, saying, please stop preaching. We feel like the flames of hell are coming up from underneath. They were standing on top of the pews. Can you imagine that? Wow. So Nehemiah said, I was fasting and I was praying before the God of heaven. I was broken. I was mourning. I was burdened. Wow. Nehemiah, his first response was prayer, not his last resort. Abraham Lincoln said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I have nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of those about me seem insufficient for the day. Yeah. Wow. So Nehemiah didn't say to the guys, hey, what do you think we ought to do about it? He said, let's get along with God. And he prayed. And he prayed a long time. And then he said, now, God, I feel like it's time for me to head in and talk to the king. And I'm not so sure what he's going to say because I'm going to give him some very big requests. And he doesn't care about the wall in Jerusalem because he's a pagan. So the last thing on his mind is how are the people in Jerusalem doing? It's like saying, I want to go to a Muslim, go to a mosque, and I can ask about the Muslims to help us out over here to church. No, we don't really care much about the... Church, you got going on down there? But he went and talked to a pagan king. And just hang in there, Gene, because I'm going to tell you next week what happened. So he says there that he fasted and he prayed and he was mourning and weeping. I mean, he was broken. This was not just some casual prayer. Well, God, please help him out if you can. Like Nehemiah, we'd never begin to rebuild until we first of all weep over the ruins. And until you're burdened about your life, and saying, I'm not satisfied where I am spiritually. I'm not satisfied where I am in my life. I'm not satisfied with my marriage. I'm not satisfied with how I'm raising my kids. I'm not satisfied with what I'm doing in my life. You'll never, ever make a change until we first of all get a hold of God and say, God, have mercy on me and work in my life in such a powerful way that I cannot do anything else but move towards the vision you've given to me. And so notice that Nehemiah's prayer shows us four great principles. Let's walk through them quickly, Lewis. First of all, we must recognize God's person. 
If I'm going to be a prayer warrior like Nehemiah and have a prayer that touches the heart of God that makes a big difference in the world and those around me, I must recognize God's person. In other words, I must recognize who he is. The awesomeness of God. He's not pops. He's not the man upstairs. He is an awesome and mighty God. So it says there in verse 5, I beseech you, O Lord God. By the way, you see that word Lord? It's all capital letters. It's his personal covenant-keeping name, Yahweh. We just sang about Yahweh a minute ago. So what he's saying is, God, you are the covenant-keeping God. That's who I'm talking to. A covenant-keeping God. Not some wishy-washy God that may help, may not help. This is the God who loves me and cares for me and wants to move my life. He's the God of heaven. Then notice what he says there. The great and awesome God. Wow. This is the great and awesome God. We use the word awesome so often. You know what the word awesome means? It means to inspire awe. It means you go, wow. And sometimes we even say it backwards. Wow. I had a friend of mine say, say it upside down, mom. <laughs> so what it is, we stand in awe of God. We say, oh, that was an awesome game the other night. That was an awesome slice of pizza. Was it as awesome as God? So we use that word so often, we forget the wonder of it all. Wow, this is God. Whew. The one who created everything. Sometimes when we're singing these songs, I can't even sing them. You know why? Because I'm weeping. And I'm just thinking. So, so thank you guys for you staying up here and, and singing because sometimes I bail out on you. And, and I'm just weeping and contemplating the words and saying, good night. And sometimes I feel like running a lap. Sometimes I feel like crawling under the pews and crying. I'd like to, but maybe Ethan will. Ethan's in good shape. He'll run for me. So he says there, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. The closer we are to God, the more we will understand about him. That's why it's so important to develop a relationship Seek my face, intimacy, not seek my hand, give me a bunch of stuff. And too many of us only care for hanging out with God to get some stuff out of him. If he keeps on giving us stuff, we'll keep hanging out with him. But he says, sometimes, why don't you just spend a little time in awe of who I am? Stop asking me for things and start just celebrating that I'm an awesome God. And so long before he got to ask him for anything, he just acknowledges who God is. And we've studied that many times. So here we see two very important truths. Number one, God is powerful enough to handle any problem that we may have. There's nothing that God can't do. So he is able to save every lost person that you know. You say, not this one, that one too. He is able to grow this congregation not only spiritually, as I've seen some tremendous spiritual growth, but numerically as well. And we can be busting out the walls and God saying, I'm waiting for you guys to start having enough faith. And then I can do it. But you're holding me back and tying my hands right now. Whatever you're going through, God says, I can handle anything. He is powerful enough. But it also reminds me when Nehemiah makes this statement, he is merciful enough to care about our concerns and help us out when we get into our jam. So you say, man, I really got myself in a mess again. These people got themselves in a mess. It wasn't God's fault they were in a mess. They're in a mess, and we'll look at why in a minute, because they got themselves in a mess. And you ever go to God and say, God, it's me again. Man, I sure have messed up again. Uh, I wish I didn't, but that's just the way it is. Now, you guys are probably really, really spiritual, but maybe somebody watching online might find themselves in that situation. You all all right? Don't look so spiritual at me. And what it is is we get ourselves in a mess. And then we have to say, God, it's me again. Yeah. Remember what I did yesterday? I said I wasn't going to do it again? Yeah. Tripped over the same pothole you told me to walk around the last time. And thankfully, he is gracious and merciful. But listen to me now. Failure to recognize the first truth will lead to doubt. And we won't believe that God is able to help us. Failing to recognize the next truth will lead to fear, which will keep us from seeking God's help. So either we believe that God can't help us out, not in this situation, in most situations, maybe, but not this situation, 
Or we'll say, maybe he can help somebody else in this situation, but probably not me. So therefore, it keeps us from really seeking God. Nehemiah believed both. He said, I believe God can do it, and I believe God will do it. Well, not only do we learn that we must recognize God's person, he's an awesome God who can do anything. But we also learn that we must request God's pardon. We must request God's pardon. Look what he said in verse 6. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now night, day and night. Doesn't sound like a two-minute prayer to me. He said, I'm, I'm fasting and praying in the morning. I'm doing it all day and night. Wow. And then he says, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which, I have, which we have sinned against you, I and my father's house have sinned. Nehemiah prayed with great humility and with great persistence. Until the church prays like this, we will never experience a fresh touch from God and our walls remain broken down. We've got to get desperate before God. We've got to really just say, God, I am absolutely desperate and you're my only hope. And if you don't come through, we have no hope from anybody else. God, we desperately need you to help us in this situation. And then rely on him to do it. When was the last time you prayed like this? With this kind of intensity? With something that God laid on your heart? Just imagine if we would always say, I'll tell you what, I got a lost loved one. And I mean, I have fasted, I have prayed, I have wept, I have been on my knees. I mean, day and night, I am really burdened about this person. And I am broken. And I have cried out to the Lord. And my, my carpet is wet from my tears that I'm weeping over this person. What would happen if we had a full altar like we normally do, but if these, these, uh, uh, this carpet right here was so wet because people were crying and just broken? And saying, I'm, telling you, I'm not just down there praying because it's the thing to do. It's the invitation time. I mean, I'm down there pouring my heart out to God. Right. I told you my buddy Brian Edenfield who taught me how to talk so slow. He said that the altars in our Baptist churches are too dry. Yeah, they are. They're too dry. And the altars in our houses are almost non-existent. Why is it that we have a bigger crowd on Sunday morning than we do on Wednesday night? The doors are open on Wednesday night. Did you know that? <laughs> John, did you tell everybody not to come on Wednesday night? Because the doors are open. And you know what we did every Wednesday night? We're touching every seat. The seat that you're sitting in was prayed over personally. Every single seat was touched. Every one of them. We, we pray over, we come up, and we literally lay hands on everything. The computer, the tripods, the social media. We come up here on the stage, we get down and on our knees, and we pray over this altar. Right. Every Wednesday night. The ladies, there, in and out of every room, praying. Sitting in all the seats in there, praying over every single room. Right. Right. And pleading with God to work in the lives of those who will be here. And we need urgent prayer. Urgent. So he says there, he said, I, I really I poured my heart out to God. And, and then he says in the second half of verse 6, he says, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you, I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statute, nor the ordinances, which you commanded your servant Moses. Wow. Notice that Nehemiah didn't make any excuses for their sin. He didn't play the blame game. He could have blamed the broken down walls on Babylon who busted them down and burned the place down with fire. He could have blamed it on his forefathers who some 70 years earlier had been rebelling against God and caused Babylon to come in there and destroy the place. But Nehemiah understood that he was a sinner just like the rest of them. So we can say, well, if my forefathers had been different, this wouldn't have ended up in the way it is now. But we have to confess, I have a hand in it as well. And so he says, I'm a sinner just like them. Notice that word corruptly in verse 7. It means to damage, to wound, to cause pain or hurt. Can I remind you this morning that when God's people sin, it causes pain and hurt to God. 
A song once asked the question, do you still feel the pain every time I fail? We cannot even comprehend the pain that Jesus felt up on the cross. And far more than the physical pain, because a lot of people got crucified. And it was physically painful. But the pain that he suffered when God, his own father, had to turn his back on him. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think about that for a second. Here is an eternal relationship. How long is eternity? Yeah, that long. And he never had one second out of all eternity where him and the Father were not on the same page. And then, on the cross, God says, I hate sin so much, I despise it. Because one of his main qualities is holiness. He is a God of love, and God is love, but he is also holy. And he hates all sin. And because Jesus took on the sin of all mankind, your sin, my sin, everybody's sin, personally, not just, well, the sins of me, my personal sins, he took on. And God says, I can no longer stand to look at you. And he turned his back on him. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God. Now he's not calling him Father. Wow. And Nehemiah understood us rebel against him. Do you want to see your kids rebel against you? It breaks your heart when your kids don't act right. Or when they say things like, I hate you. Or, or maybe your kids are grown and they don't call you and you say, hey, they kind of forgot all the things I did for them all their lives. And it breaks your heart. And God says it breaks my heart so much more. Because you love with an imperfect love. I love with a perfect love. And he knows that these broken down walls when you rebel against them breaks down the walls of prayer and unity and faith and service and all the other walls that we'll look at. He knows that when these walls are broken down, it causes great damage and brokenness to our homes, to our marriages, and even to our churches. It's amazing how many churches are splitting over silly, insignificant things. No wall can be rebuilt unless we humble ourselves, repent of our sins, and ask God's forgiveness. So listen to what uh, Proverbs 28, 13 says. He who conceals his transgressions, his sins, will not prosper. God's not going to bless that kind of life. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. So when I sin, I don't just say, ah, it's no big deal. Yeah, a lot of people do it. Tell the cop, yeah, I know I was speeding and I went through that stop sign, but good night, everybody does that around here. I'm sure they do. I got a few of those. I got you now. So we must recognize God's person. We must request God's pardon. But a third principle I learned from Nehemiah's prayer life, we must remember God's promises. We must remember God's promises. Look what he said in verse 8. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. So he says, yeah, you don't do right, I'm going to punish you all. That's why they were scattered, because Babylon came in and destroyed the city. and scattered them all over the place. And so they've been under captivity. They're living as slaves. They're still living in captivity, but they've been allowed to come home now. But Persia's still in charge. And then in the New Testament, we read about Rome is now in charge. And they had the audacity to say to Jesus, we have never been enslaved. And Jesus didn't even acknowledge that ridiculous statement. They've been enslaved from the time of judges. And it says, uh, you will scatter you know, among the peoples. Then he said in verse 9, But if you return to me, this is God, he said, this is, this is what you said, God, and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you have been scattered when the most part of the heavens. I mean, that's like, no matter where they are, they could be on the other side. He said, I can find them. I haven't lost them. I know exactly where they are. And I will bring them back. And I will gather them together. And there I'll bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell, which is Jerusalem. Here Nehemiah calls on God to remember what he had promised. Namely that he would punish sin, but he would also forgive it if they repented and restore them. Now he's not saying this like, hey God, you forgot your word. Like God's like, oh, did I say that? What was the verse again? Help me out with that. No, God remembered all that stuff. He's not doing it for God's benefit. Listen now, he's doing it for his own benefit. 
And Nehemiah is saying, I need to be reminded of this. So oftentimes we see people in the Bible praying and they say, God, remember you said this. And then they would go to God. Not as though to throw it up in his face and say, hey, God, you owe me now. Not because God forgot these things, but because he's relying on these promises, because he's recognizing. And what I told you there, Lord, covenant-keeping God. So he's saying, God, you are covenant-keeping God. And I'm asking you to honor the covenant. Wow. It is good for us to remember that our God is a covenant-keeping God. If we do this, it gives us great hope. We say, man, I'm really in a mess. But there's hope. I can see some light at the end of the tunnel. Things can be restored. My life can turn around. I can get better. I don't have to live like this forever. I can press on to a brighter future. Now, can I give you a simple truth? You can't remember God's promises if you don't know them. How did Nehemiah know that God said this? Because he read his Bible. And so how are you going to know what God's word says if you don't read it? That's why we really push upon you each and every week. Read your Bible every day. Right. Read good devotionals that like we, we tell you about Spurgeon and, and Chambers and others. R pray every day. Get plugged into the life groups and learn and grow. Hang around godly Christians who are going to challenge you and inspire you and mentor you and help you grow. Right. So I want to hang around people who are going somewhere. I don't want to hang around a lot of negative people who just want to whine and complain and never have anything good to say and can't really contribute to the conversation except for just be critical and complainer. I want to hang around people who are going to inspire me and challenge me. But remember, remember now what I told you Johnny Hunt told me many years ago. Everybody ought to have three people in their life. They ought to have a Paul in their life, somebody who's further down the track than they are that can help mentor them. They ought to have a Timothy in their life, somebody who they're pouring their life in, like Paul is pouring his life into Timothy, somebody you're bringing along with you. And then you ought to have a Barnabas in your life, somebody to encourage you during difficult times. And so I got all of those. I got some Pauls in my life, I got some Timothys in my life, I got some Barnabases in my life. So it's not always just about me. I don't want to just have all Pauls and say, well, who are you bringing along with you? Uh, nobody, I'm just kind of soaking up for anybody else. No, you bring somebody along with you. And listen, not only do you want a Barnabas in your life, but be a Barnabas to somebody else. Be an encourager. I want people to say, man, I feel good. Uh, challenged, but I feel good from hanging around John. Now, boy, that guy, he, he just really depressed me every time I'm around him. <laughs> I love the people that God's placed in my life. I mean, I didn't even know Steve was going to be here today. And it brought great joy when I walked down the hallway and saw Steve standing there. I mean, he, he is an encourager in my life, I can tell you right now. And a challenge in his wonderful wife and precious kids. And, and I told him, I said, tell, tell Miles and all my other little buddies. Cause he, now, Miles knows me because he's a little bit older. But the other kids, you know, they, they don't really know me that well. But I said, make sure you tell them uh, that Uncle John loves them. And listen to their mama. Because that poor lady, you pray for Haley now. She's got four boys in that house. I mean, so can you imagine me and a lady with four boys? I mean, energy. Woo! Testosterone. The kids are jumping off. Steve loves it because they're jumping off the couch and tackling them. Don't do that to mama. <laughs> you all pray for Haley. Well, we've got to recognize God's person. We need to request God's pardon. We need to remember God's promises. But finally, we must rely on God's power. Amen. If we're going to rebuild any walls worth building, we've got to rely on God's power. And in case nobody's told you, he is a powerful God. Look what he said there in verse 10. So he's already asked God to remember his covenant. And he said, I'll, you can get them back no matter where they, how far gone they are. And he says, they are your servants. Your people who you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Can I remind you this morning that the rebuilding of spiritual walls is the work of God's people. Yeah. Now, we'll see how a pagan king made an investment in this. But the people who built the wall was Nehemiah and the Jews. Yeah. Rebuilding spiritual walls is not for non-Christians. This is the work of the church. Yeah. Right. And so thank God he lets us kind of get in on it. And some of y'all just sitting in on the conversation. But the challenge is for those who repented of their sins and have surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. You cannot even pray unless you have gone through the Lord Jesus Christ. You have not gone through the Lord Jesus Christ, even if you mention his name in prayer 
until you did what John told us to do this morning in our life group, John 1.12. As many as received him, received Jesus. To them, and only them, right. he gave the right to become children of God. Right. And the Father only listens to his children. Right. So you can't even rebuild the first wall of prayer unless you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So this is the work of God's people. And we want you to become one of God's people and jump on board because we need all hands on deck. But remember, this is for the people of God. If you are lost, you need to repent of your sins and turn your life over to Jesus Christ. And I would do it quickly because you saw in our life group this morning it's not a very good place that the lost go to. It's a place of pain and suffering and torment. And there is no hope. And I don't know if anybody ever told you about purgatory. There is no purgatory. That's a lie from the pit of hell. There's no second chance on the other side. There's no negotiating, having a conversation with God and saying, well, I mean, now that I see that it's real, I want to go ahead and put my name in the hat. Yeah. It's not going to work that way. And, and remember what we learned a few weeks ago when we looked at counterfeit Christians yes, and how many convincing fakes there are. And Judas was perhaps the most convincing fake of all. And he fooled himself, and he fooled everybody around him, but he did not fool the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. And so I would fall on my knees today and ask God, do I really belong to you? Because I cannot even build this first brick in this wall if I don't know him. So he said, this is for your people. And by the way, that word redeemed, you know what that word redeemed means? It means that he bought back. Well, what does that mean? I was born a slave. On my way to hell, I was a slave to my sins. And so a slave has to be paid off. They've got to free me. So a slave's got to do whatever the master tells them. And, and what is he doing? He's doing the, the will of his father, who is the devil. So you either belong to God or you belong to the devil. And everybody is born belonging to the devil. And we have to receive him. We have to make an adjustment in our life. Get off that broad road. Get onto the narrow road. Start heading towards heaven. But I've got to make an adjustment, a course correction in my life. And then he says... What he's done, he's redeemed, he's paid the price. Wow. So Jesus, long before I ever even thought about him, he said, John, I've already picked up the tab, and it's paid in full. And there's nothing that you can do. You can't do nothing to pay for it. You can't put a few bucks in the plate to help me out with it. You cannot pay me back for it. It is a free gift. And, and that's why I was in the grave, and the Lord Jesus Christ what he said was, hey, John, I've paid the debt for you. Come on out of that grave. And you know what I did, Bob? I ran out of that grave. I ran out of the grave. Lewis, take three laps around the block for me, will you? And so I hope and pray that you will be redeemed because God wants you. And by the way, he's paid for you as well. So if you want to come and hang out over at John's house, guess what? The meal's free. It's free. It's free. And we'll have plenty so it's not like we say, well, I'd like to go over there, but I heard you're only going to buy a couple of slices of pizza. No, we're going to have plenty. We're going to have plenty. So now, but who's going to enjoy the meal? Only those who come and hang out with us. It's there. Dinner table served. Y'all come on. So God's power saved us, and only God's power can help rebuild the walls in our life. Nobody else. Like Nehemiah, we need to realize that the work of rebuilding is way over our head. Could you imagine rebuilding a wall? Have you ever been to Jerusalem? It's a big city. You can just Google a map and, and you can look what the wall looks like. I was there. I walked around that wall. And you can look at it and see, this is a big wall. And they didn't have modern day equipment like you do today. You know what else they didn't have? They didn't have any money. Why didn't they have any money? Because they're slaves. And slaves don't have any money. And they're enslaved to Persia. Now the king, he wanted to get some favor with their God. So he says, I think that I'll, I'll let people worship whatever God they want to. Where before, that wasn't the case. So he says, yeah, now that I've taken over Babylon, what I'm going to do, I'm going to allow the Jews to go back. Because if they can worship their God, then maybe their God will be happy with me, and they'll be happy with me, and they'll be better, better citizens of my kingdom. So I'm going to let them go back. He didn't care about, about Yahweh. He didn't care about Jerusalem. He just did it to kind of, it was a political move for him. And so he let them go back. But they had no money to rebuild the wall. So we're going to look at who paid for the wall. And it wasn't Nehemiah. Preview of coming attractions. Come back next week and you'll find out. 
If I don't leave you hanging on a cliff, you won't come back next week. And so the question is, how is the wall of prayer in your life? Is it strong? Maybe a few bricks missing out of it? Broken down walls leave a person vulnerable. We try to do things in our own strength and forget that we desperately need Almighty God and get ourselves in a mess. Before I even get up out of the bed, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to wake up. One day he's going to say, time's up, and my time will come. And remember, if my time comes, uh, John, somebody's got to preach next Sunday, all right? So we don't just cancel and say, oh, our pastor's not here no more. We miss our pastor. We love him. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for missing me. But somebody's got to come here in this pulpit next Sunday and preach the word. So the show must always go on. We do not hold it up for anybody. And so my time will come. Your time will come. And I think about that. Some of you are further down the road than I am. But I may pass you. Just because you're older than me doesn't mean that I won't live the same amount of time. So I may only get 10 more seconds. All right? So if I only get 10 more seconds, John, come up here and take over the invitation and then carry my body out afterwards, all right? Just, Steve will push it outside for a little while and then they'll come get it later. But well, we've got to have an invitation. So what about you? Don't keep kicking the can down the road. If you know you never repented of your sins and surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, remember what we learned in our life group this morning, you don't want to end up there. We talk about going to hell for eternity, but remember what we learned today? That hell is tossed into the lake of fire. So that's where we're going to spend eternity is in hell, which is in the lake of fire. And there's no coming out of there. None whatsoever. No second chance. No purgatory. That's a lie. It's a terrible, terrible place, Steve. And we really need to plead, God have mercy. God have mercy. Now you might say, well, I'm on the team. Uh, I know Jesus Christ, my personal Lord and Savior. What are you doing about it to get others in? So I, I put it out there. My buddy Spurgeon, he had a good word and paraphrasing him, and I shared the, the uh, devotion that he had, then I put my own thoughts above it. But basically what he said was, being shy and having a shy personality is no excuse for not carrying out the Great Commission. You may not stand behind the sacred desk and proclaim, but there are people at your office that will never come and hear me preach, but they'll get a chance to talk to you about it. There's people in your family who won't come here and listen to me preach, but you get a chance to talk to them about it. And so you have an opportunity later on today at your fellowship time to start talking about the gospel and witnessing to people. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to say, this is an opportunity for me to give the gospel to these people? Or just say, hey, let's play some games, get a bite to eat and get out of here. Everything we do is always with the intention of the Great Commission. Nothing is more important than carrying out the Great Commission. But it all starts with prayer. I've got to have that burden on my heart. Before Nehemiah even went to Jerusalem and saw the conditions there, he got the report and he fell on his face before God and pleaded for God to move long before he went to Jerusalem. God helped me that I would plead with the Lord to work in all of these situations long before I go and talk to anybody and ask him, God, work in my heart so I can join you in the great work you're already doing. Let's stand for prayer there at home. You're still with us? Put that coffee cup down because now we have what we call the invitation. The invitation is the most important part of the service. Remember what we learned from, uh, from Jesus is that Everybody responded to the message that he gave. They either responded by receiving it or rejecting it, but everybody there responded to the message. Same thing's going to happen here. Everybody in this room will respond to the message that we heard today. Everybody there at home is going to respond. Either you're going to click off. Some of you probably already did that a long time ago because you got tired of hearing me, and you moved on and just kind of stumbled through here, and they come and they go. That's what they do. They're on here for a few seconds, and then they get out. Uh-oh, he's talking about Jesus. Let's get out of here. Go find something else. Go find some dopey cat video on TikTok. That's what they're going to do. And so the invitation is now, and Jesus says you're going to respond in one of two ways. Either you're going to repent of your sins and surrender to him and ask him to rebuild those walls in your life, or you're going to say, I feel like it's pretty good. Maybe next week. Catch you next time. God help you to do it today, the right way. All right? So there at home, here on campus, the invitation is going to be open. We have an open invitation to come down here to this altar. And you can pray by yourself. I told you before, nobody's going to bug you. You've seen how it goes. We don't bother you. We don't come down here and start asking a lot of questions. You come down and you talk to the Lord. You want me to pray with you? I'm here to pray with you and for you. But you can just come down and talk to God all by yourself if you want to. Whatever makes you feel good. Uh, the guy's got a song picked out for us. Then the altar's open. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, you are so good to us. 
so merciful and kind and so gracious, we stumble and fall so often. And Lord, we must confess like Nehemiah that we have acted terribly and corruptly. It wasn't just the people before us, it wasn't just somebody else, it's us personally. We need to confess our own personal sins. And God, I pray you'd help us to use this time and the invitation to do that. Lord, I pray for those in here who have yet to repent of their sins and surrender to Jesus Christ. I beg and plead with you to get a hold of them and to show them their desperate need to cry out to you before it's too late. It may already be too late for some. And Father, I pray for those on, watching us on our, on our uh, Facebook live stream, those who watch on YouTube later, Lord, I plead for them as well that you work in their hearts and lives. May nobody leave here the same way they walked in. Father, make us more like you. Speak, and we will obey. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.